All right, so I will uh, just uh, go ahead and uh, get started. Um, I wanted to thank everyone uh, from uh, the lecture series, especially Dr. Hampson for uh, organizing this. Um, and today I thought it would be useful to talk about the urologic care of adolescents and young adults. Uh, this is a topic that um, as someone who uh, specializes in uh, complex uh, patients such as those in the spina bifida world, um, it uh, is uh, very important to me and I think that uh, it actually uh, is, is useful to all people in urology um, because these patients uh, really uh, do um, need our help. Uh, so um, thank you guys for uh, letting me speak and uh, if anyone has questions, I'll try my best to catch them on the chat or the Q&A, and if not, I will try to um, go over all of them at the end. All right, um, so I have no disclosures, and I won't be discussing any off-label use of medications. So in terms of an outline, um, I thought I'd first go over some of the background and shaping factors in the young adult health uh, world and go over the current status of adolescent and young adult care. Um, and uh, the transition process is something that is a little bit in flux as we learn more about how best to tackle this. Uh, but I think that some of the resources from Got Transition and AUA and a few other things are useful for everyone to know about in terms of where these patients were from and where coming when they end up in your office. Um, and then in terms of future, um, you know, care, I wanted to go over some of the urologic aspects that get brought up frequently, uh, the role for urologists, and then future directions uh, moving us forward. So in terms of the background, why is this important? Um, congenital urologic conditions grow up, and that could be something as simple as, uh, you know, something that was treated when the child was young um, and then, uh, you know, needs to be followed, or it can be much more complex. Um, and there's plenty of shared diagnoses that may benefit from a partner approach uh, that present over the adolescent and young adult time span. And so someone who's at the age of 17 may come to my clinic at a pediatric hospital, or they may present to an adult hospital. Um, and I think that it's useful to think about their mindset and also figure out the best way to care for these young adults. Um, and then young adults with complex medical conditions develop separate urologic concerns. Um, Part of this talk is going to be focusing on some of these complex urologic conditions, knowing that it is a broad field and there's no way I could co cover all of that in a short period of time. But I wanted to highlight some of the things that uh, commonly get brought up, uh, some pitfalls and concerns, and then try to figure out potential solutions and how um, anyone who cares for these patients may, uh, may be able to serve them best. So in terms of patient population, when you think about this, large umbrella of adolescent and young adult health, um, you look to some of the defining organizations as to why they uh, they might um, define a certain population one way or the other. And it does cover a large range of uh, ages. Um, so the WHO in some of their uh, literature, they talk about this adolescent group from 10 to 19 and youth as 15 to 24. Um, and then young people, which is the all-encompassing group from 10 to 24. Um, so, uh, I don't fall in that range anymore, um, but it's a huge number of people. Uh, that being said, uh, I'll sp focus mostly on the adolescent and uh, young adult population. Um, in our institution, we end up seeing patients through about the age of 26, uh, depending on the diagnosis and condition. And so that's what I'm most used to dealing with in my everyday practice. However, I think it's useful to think also about the adolescent and young adults with special health care needs. Um, and that is a very long acronym that is uh, in the literature, as well as the youth with special health care needs. And then populations are defined differently depending on which paper you're reading and depending on which group of um, practitioners uh, the target audience is for. So if you think about the adolescents from the WHO, they might be thinking 10 to 19, 12 to 19, depending on the population. Uh, in urology, we've seen terms such as emerging adults from some of our colleagues. Um, and then in oncology, uh, they really have a wide range, anywhere from about 15 to 39 from the National Cancer Institutes or 15 to 29 from the Children's Oncology Group. And when I look at all of this together, I think mostly that we're looking at an adolescent population anywhere from about 10, 12 to the late teens, and then the young adults in the late teens to early 20s. Um, and I think that that will encompass much of what we're talking about today. 
So when I think about the umbrella of adolescent and young adult urology, it's very, very broad. Um, it can be anything, as I mentioned, from neurogenic bladder and spina bifida. Um, it can include uh, congenital conditions such as hydronephrosis or uh, variations in sex development, or something that pops up, uh, such as urinary tract infections, overactive bladder, urethral strictures. Um, it can be something uh, that was treated and now uh, may not be the top of anyone's mind, such as an endocentric testicle that may need to be treated again in the future or impact uh, a man's fertility, um, or something that uh, may, you know, need uh, to be a secondary condition when we're thinking about uncle fertility or fertility preservation in um, individuals undergoing uh, treatment uh, that may impact their future ability to, uh, to build a family. And so adolescent and young adults are a variable group of patients. Um, they may seek care at pediatric or adult fast facilities and developmentally, they may be closer to childhood or adulthood based on patient and family factors. And so when we think about the care continuum, um, it can go from pediatrics to adolescent to adult. And look, they're just going to grow right up. They're going to have their suit jacket on and be able to go right off into the world. Um, right. Of course, it's not that easy. Uh, and when we think about the urologic care continuum, this was a really nice graphic from uh, a paper from a few years ago looking at the research and potential uh, questions in our field. Um, and I thought that it really nicely uh, highlighted a lot of the things that we think about when we're thinking about a, a a patient individual as a whole um, and what supports we can help to make that patient uh, in the shaded blue area um, have optimal, you know, uh, nephrologic health, continence, uh, sexuality, community integration, and independence. Um, and I think that goals when we're talking about urologic care that actually really do play um, critically into how we decide uh, what might be the best thing uh, to, uh, to help this patient achieve at this current point in their life. And so when I think about adolescent and young adult patients, um, initially their care may be by pediatric providers, or as I mentioned, they may have a new diagnosis in this period. Um, and I think all of those need to be taken in context because that will help determine where the patient uh, might be best housed um, and how to kind of empower them to move forward on their healthcare journey uh, and ensure that by the age of, you know, that later end of the age range, they're comfortably in a place that they can continue their care. So when we think about the adolescent mindset, I'm always struck by partners who um, take care of uh, late teenagers and early um, young men uh, who are not used to taking care of, uh, of younger people. Um, that you know they, they speak about the mindset being different, um, and I think that that's important to just acknowledge um, is that adolescent mindsets in the now and more now, um, they have critical relationships with friends, they seek validation and respect, um, and above all, you, you must protect their confidential, confidentiality and discussions. And so I think it's important to, you know, any adolescent that you're going to be taking care of to really try to build rapport uh, and really try to uh, get to their level and figure out what makes them tick. Uh, that can be harder <laughs> in certain populations, um, but certainly I think that treating them with respect, um, trying to uh, really uh, mention that you're trying to feel, like, get them better um, or address their issue and really trying to drill down on what it is that, that brings them there um, can really help uh, even the, the closed off teenagers uh, kind of open up a little bit and it may take a few visits. Um, when we think about transitional care, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, the healthcare tr transition, they mentioned that basically now it's a shared responsibility for pediatric and adult care clinicians. Um, and I think the biggest thing that I've run into is sort of the accepting and partnering with young adults, um, because I think that it is uh, it is multiple people in this system. Um, and as pediatric providers, we want to make sure that patients are well uh, treated and empowered to know their own conditions. Um, and it's critical for us to partner with uh, the receiving providers. Um, and I'll mention all the different factors of that as we move forward. Forward. So when we're thinking about what is the goal of transitional care, um, we want to make sure that medical conditions that are active are treated and monitored appropriately. Uh, we want to think about a successful transition of care to appropriate adult providers, and that can sometimes be a little bit of a challenge. Um, and we want to optimize social supports to allow continuous access to health care, whether that be insurance, whether that be um, transportation, anything that goes into uh, allowing a, an individual to obtain the health care that they need. 
And then um, part of the reason we think about doing transition at all is that as individuals age, they're going to have new and emerging health concerns. Um, and I think that that's the most important thing that I like to, to think about when I'm trying to tell families that, oh yes, you might be able to stay with us until this age point, but we should start thinking about this sooner because as people age, they have different and uh, more pressing concerns uh, that are not always best addressed in our uh, facility. So when you think about the healthcare landscape, um, the Affordable Care Act uh, did allow um, AYA patients to maintain insurance status until age 26. And that was one of the um, reasons that a lot of pediatric facilities can now follow patients till sort of the mid to late 20s. Um, and that allows a natural transition. The goal uh, is that a patient who might be moving around for college or having early um, you know, adulthood, um, by the time they have settled, would then be able to obtain their own coverage uh, and really fully complete their transition. Um, however, healthcare coverage does not always mean high quality coverage. Unfortunately, in our current uh, American system, um, plans may be lacking in certain realms. Uh, and this is where our colleagues in the social work um, and financial support uh, can be super helpful. Um, I found that the social work care coordinators um, and really even just uh, the insurance uh, companies themselves, depending on uh, the one that's there, um, can be helpful in terms of at least outlining what is covered so that in the future we can figure out how do we obtain more broader coverage or how do we put this under the umbrella of something that could then be covered in the future for this patient. Um, but it remains a little bit of a, of a maze and, and you can see why some patients and individuals um, feel very frustrated by this. And then, of course, um, uh, the coronavirus pandemic has uh, um, given us an additional factor to consider. Um, I will say that it has increased the ability to complete telehealth appointments. Um, and in certain patients in this population, that can be very helpful. It does require the ability to um, but I haven't found too many teenagers who are without telephones, um, some of them, uh, and, and we can do video visits or telephone visits. Uh, coverage is variable, uh, and certainly if insurance uh, was work dependent, uh, it could then be lost. And then I think we've all noticed individual and family stress uh, has heightened during this pandemic. Um, we have noticed that in our clinics with uh, certain types of uh, conditions coming um, to be more of the forefront of the, of the problem. Um, and so that changes the, the priorities of some of our patients. So when we think about transitional challenges, um, this is something I wanted to focus on because I think that as a field, as we work through how best to approach patients and uh, help with transition, um, thinking about kind of where they end up is one thing that, uh, that seems overwhelming at times. Um, having well-trained um, uh, reconstructive urologists at uh, each part of the country um, willing to accept uh, complex patients uh, would be an ideal goal. Uh, but I don't think in many parts of the country we're 100% there yet. And so we've heard from adult providers uh, that they don't feel that they have the skill of their training, they don't feel they have comfort with complex reconstructions or uh, congenital conditions. Um, and then from the patient side of things, uh, oftentimes these multiple disciplinary clinics are patient-centered pediatric approach. Um, and then you go out into the sort of the cold adult world uh, where there's less of a, of a support. Um, and certainly I know that there's many institutions out there that do have the support for these handoff clinics um, and overlap clinics, and I think that those are wonderful models, um, but do require many resources. And so I wanted to approach this from um, how best to optimize care without necessarily the uh, safety net of some of these uh, um, more uh, supported clinics. And then I think that the one thing we should also realize is that a lot of patients with complex uh, and congenital urologic conditions will end up using emergency and urgent care with a lack of successful transition. Um, and from there, they may end up with a urologist being the person that they identify most as their physician. Um, and so this is something that I've seen repeatedly, um, both during training and in, um, in practice, where uh, patients uh, in the adult world may have a primary uh, care doctor that they see once or twice. Um, and if their most active issues are urologic, they end up seeing their urologist more than any of their other doctors. Um, they need catheters, they need medicines, they might have a kidney stone or even a urinary tract infection. And those are where they, uh, where they spend most of their time in the healthcare realm. And so I think that as urologists, it's important for 
us to realize this um, and, uh, and know that um, despite uh, not being primary care providers, we may be functioning as uh, their most important uh, physician uh, or provider. And so with that comes some responsibility. When we think about who will be my doctor, receiving providers are very important. It's important to know where you're transitioning to. Um, however, uh, you know, noticed in a recent study that uh, pediatric urologists would refer to an interest in transitional care, but only about 45% of these pediatric urologists had someone to send their patients to. Um, and so here is where I would like to suggest that care teams could be formed to fill the gap. Um, certainly, I think that we need someone who is willing and someone who wants to see these patients. And that may be a partnership of pediatric adult specialists and advanced practice providers. Um, and there's a balance of location, access, and active needs. Um, what we've noticed is that um, other factors really do matter. And I'll speak a little bit more about that. Um, and if the patient has to travel 150 miles to get to uh, their, their clinic, uh, it may be less likely than, than if there's a, um, a, a combination that could be a slightly more local. And so um, Dr. Soslin out of uh, Vanderbilt um, looked at the non-clinical factors in adult reconstructive bladder patients and found that it was prevalent in the population to have some poor health literacy and unmarried status and marked distance from the care center. Um, again, I think this highlights that if the patient uh, is able to make a visit um, and, uh, and arrives in your clinic, even if it might not be a perfect fit, um, I think that there is uh, many things that could be done to kind of optimize that and continue to, to continue on that transition journey. Um, and, and I'd like to empower all of our, uh, our um, viewers today to, to work with us for that. So when we think about legal issues, um, I am not a lawyer. Uh, however, I do think it's important to just be aware of these things. Uh, we wanna think about insurance coverage. That can be variable by plan, by state. Crossing state lines is often uh, easy in the car. However, when you think about different facilities that are right next to the state lines, uh, depending on the care coverage, that can be um, something that does require some social work assistance. And then we think about capacity. Um, some of these patients have intellectual disability, developmental delay, um, and I think and to be honest and think about those things when we're planning for the future. Um, it's important to think about what is the, the goal of the family uh, and the individual in terms of independence. Uh, will there be guardianship uh, and will there be, uh, you know, as such to any types of treatment? Um, and we think about paperwork and status, you need to make sure that those things are documented or at least uh, in the process so that um, everything can be um, in terms of uh, uh, on paper appropriately uh, documented as well. And so I wanted to highlight a little bit about the Got Transition website, um, which is something that uh, is a really nice resource. Uh, they have extremely detailed care uh, guides and transition guides, but I thought that this graphic was useful um, because it basically talks about all the different parts of transition um, and thinking about when we should be starting this process and when we might be kind of finishing it. And I think that, you know, with this, each individual is going to have a different approach. I have some 12 to 15 year olds that come see me and say, why are there butterflies on the wall? I do not want to be here. I, I want to go to, to a more appropriate place. And then I have some later adults, um, you know, even in their mid to late twenties who, who can't see a reason to, to think about transitioning. Um, and we're working through all of that. In an ideal world, I think that uh, early on in adolescence, around the age of 11, 12, um, you need to spend some time with the family and also with the patient individually and think about, you know, the changes that are happening in their lives. Think about the fact that there is a transition that's going to come uh, for all parts of life and with that will be a healthcare transition. Um, and I think that as we, as we tackle this slowly, um, this becomes a lot more manageable rather than thinking about age 18. Oh dear, I'm going to age out of this system. What can we do to do everything all at once? That can be very, very overwhelming. And so when we think about a transitional process in an ideal world, there would be a gradual process with an active participation from the family and the patient, a clear destination with accepting providers. And as I mentioned, some transitions will not have ideal conditions. Um, you may find that there's a patient that has had a large gap in their care uh, and then uh, returned because they need the catheters, they had an acute urinary tract infection, 
they may find that they'd been living in an area without local specialists or um, specialists who are unwilling to uh, accept them as patients. Uh, and then the last thing I'll mention again is just this lack of primary care provider. Um, and I think that having uh, recently had to find a primary, primary care provider myself, uh, it's a hard thing to do. There's not as many as out there as you would think. Um, so I, I think that this is just something that if we have knowledge about, uh, we wanna make sure that we can, can recognize and then continue to try to plug that per, uh, patient in with someone appropriate. So when is the patient ready for transition? Um, each patient is different. Uh, you must take into consideration all medical conditions and specialists. I found that as a team, it works much better. Uh, if you have a patient who sees multiple specialists at your hospital, um, kind of keeping a working dialogue with those specialists in terms of trying to transition, uh, especially if they're going to maintain their care at one institution. Uh, people are often very hesitant to change uh, specialists until it's all done as a group. Uh, transition is most successful, as I said, when the specialists are coordinated. Um, and sometimes that's not possible depending on the availability of the care partner. Uh, there are plenty of questionnaires out there that can think about how best to um, assess the readiness for transition. The track questionnaire uh, is available on the link here. Uh, and basically this is a transition readiness questionnaire. Uh, and it has simple things that, uh, that you know, if you look, think back to being an adolescent, um, we, that were a little bit overwhelming at first. Uh, do you, can you fill the prescription? Um, do you know what the medications are? Uh, do, did you arrange for a ride? Did you call the doctor if you were having symptoms? Uh, did you fill out the form yourself rather than having your guardian do it? Um, did you make a list of questions you wanted to ask the doctor? Um, so I usually uh, have started with um, a few factors from the GOT transition and these questionnaires and just ask pointedly in each visit to think about how best to kind of proceed uh, for each patient. And then the other thing I've found uh, a few patients to find very, very helpful is sort of a patient advocate or a medical mentor. Um, I like the idea of a medical mentor because it thinks about the idea of trying to empower the patient. And, um, you know, I think depending on the program, they could be different things. Um, however, in my experience, the patient advocate is a peer with a similar condition, speaks with the patient and helps in a supportive role. Um, and I think that uh, certainly, um, other, uh, other um, disciplines such as oncology are much more experienced with that, but we've definitely, as a urology, uh, started to incorporate that into many of our care models. Uh, and then a medical mentor, in my mind, um, from uh, the experience I've had with families and uh, support persons uh, is, is sort of trained in confidentiality, support, and active listening, but has some experience navigating the medical world in terms of how to fill the prescriptions, how to obtain, you know, that referral, how to think about making the appointment, um, and works one-on-one -on -one with patients. And I, I, I found that that can be very, very helpful. Um, online support groups may fill that similar role for some individuals, but I feel like a lot of individuals require that one-on-one -on -one, um, sort of outside their family unit, uh, and that can be really, really useful. And again, transition does take active work. Um, so for the patient, there's all these skills that need to be practiced uh, to kind of build their autonomy. Um, and I found that the support of the family, they need to kind of let go and step back. Um, they have to support and practice at home. Um, the provider, there's a lot of work making sure that the patient is kind of ready for transition, uh, documenting and detailing conditions and procedures, documenting um, sort of a, a packet for receiving adult care partners, and active and continued input through the transition process process because this is not a handoff and you're gone type of process. Um, in a perfect world uh, that may work for some patients, uh, but most of the time this requires ongoing communication, support, visits, and it may be back and forth for a little while until, uh, until things are all straightened out. And then when we think about special health care needs, um, I found that the family are most, uh, can be some of the challenging aspects of the transitional process. Um, most of the parents have pride and identity of being a caregiver to the individual. And so um, for them, you know, it's, it's hard enough that their child is growing up. It's even harder when they feel like their role is being limited because this is, this is one of the major parts of their life. 
Um, so I try to celebrate successes. I had an 11 year old with um, chronic condition today in clinic. We talked about medications. We talked about why she took the medications. Uh, she already self catheterized. Um, and I applauded her for knowing the different medications, how often she took it and what the names were and what they were for. Um, and I feel like that is something that, uh, that should be applauded because there's plenty of people in the world who are much older than age 11 who take medicines and don't know what they're for. Um, and then I like to set expectations for patient-centered care with family support. Um, so that next visit we can say, okay, we're gonna tackle you know, your water intake and think about you know, why that is important um, and, and mom's going to help, but this is going to be mainly your responsibility. And so I think that um, that works uh, in many patients and families, um, but, uh, but certainly uh, can take some, some repetition. And then these are um, some videos out of New Year's, uh, that I thought were very useful in terms of uh, becoming an adult. Uh, these are just some screenshots from them and they're available. Um, and I think that it, it's helpful because it, uh, it frames things in, uh, in a very uh, easy to uh, interpret um, video type uh, environment uh, and, and can be useful to basically describe the process to family members that are a little bit skeptical at first. Um, and I think it sets the stage uh, for some of the things that we'll talk about in future slides. Um, there's plenty of uh, resources. Uh, this is out of Lurie Children's uh, looking at a hospital-based skill workshop that I believe is on pause due to COVID, but um, I really liked uh, that they were kind of navigating to smooth passages to adulthood, um, had nice imagery, and really talked about a lot of the things we mentioned. Self-advocacy, healthcare skills, insurance, work, mental wellness, and thinking about uh, higher education. And then again, out of Lurie, this was just a timeline example of um, their spina bifida. Uh, thinking about, you know, birth to three, um, the adolescent 14 to 18, and then 18 years and up. What types of things were available to them? Um, and I think that this speaks to the complexity of all the different pieces that can go into this. Um, and we're having multiple um, team members working on it uh, to ensure every piece is in place uh, can really benefit the whole, the whole um, patient population. So I'll go over a little bit of some of the key adolescent and young adult cares. Um, and certainly, as I mentioned, urology is a very broad field. I didn't want to um, focus too much on each part of this, um, but I think it's important to kind of review, you know, the things that we think about when we're uh, thinking about patients getting older um, and uh, how best to tackle these if you end up being a receiving provider. So when we think about renal health, um, certainly many uh, GU congenital conditions have an increased risk for renal insufficiency. Um, and some of the patients we see most frequently, including neurogenic bladder, reflux nephropathy, and posterior urethral valves are definitely in this category. Uh, so there's a critical need to monitor, detect, and di diagnose active renal disease. Um, and when we think about long-term, uh, we can deal with hypertension, cardiovascular health, and proteinuria. And so the thing that uh, that has come up several times is sort of how best to monitor these things, especially over their transition from age 17 to age 19, um, when you're technically no longer, you know, a child and, and now in the adult category. Um, and what we found is there are variable methods to measure renal function depending on healthcare provider and institution. If it's a urologist, they may order creatinine. If it's a nephrologist, they may order a variety of other things. And primary care doctors um, may check sort of um, a panel of labs. So when we think about CKD equations, um, certainly I think creatinine has been in question in the spina bifida population for a while. Cystatin C is a promising alternative, um, and we have shown um, several years ago that that may um, more appropriately uh, stage some patients into chronic kidney disease in the spina bifida population. However, there is confusion across all of the pediatric and adult equations. There's many different assays in terms of how to pr predict this. Um, and when you think about pediatric equations, a lot of them have a strict cutoff at age 18. Um, and most patients, uh, I don't think, you know, become different patients on their 18th birthday. Um, they're pretty similar to the patient that they were at 17 and a half, and they're pretty similar to the patient they'll be when they're 18 and a half or 19. And so I think that this has led to some confusion. And Dr. Bowen and Chu out of um, Chicago, I uh, had a nice paper recently talking about all these different equations and how best to kind of follow these over time. And their takeaway was that consistent use of GFR averages over transition may ease confusion and allow serial monitoring or real function. And I think that that um, speaks to the point that 
whatever you're doing, be consistent. Um, and I think that the pediatric equations are troublesome uh, in that they may only uh, go up to age 18 and then are not supposed to be used. Um, so one of the other things that had been brought up was this full age spectrum equation. Um, and uh, I think that this is something that uh, could gain traction in the future. Um, I haven't seen it used too widely, but the idea is that you can basically um, use this full age spectrum with different Q values, which is a median serum creatinine for age and height, and that would allow um, more accurate estimation of uh, GFR. And so they compared this with the Schwartz equation and the CKD epi one and found it to be less biased and as accurate. Um, so that's something that uh, we may see more of in the future, but I think thinking about these things and knowing uh, that the equations may show um, subtle differences is something that uh, that you should be transparent with your patients about and also just be mindful of, uh, of the numbers that might change over time. And then we think about bladder health as urologists. Obviously, this is one of our main concerns. Um, we think about active management of bladder dysfunction, which is critical to maintain health um, in any uh, condition that has bladder dysfunction. Um, so CIC irrigation uh, with the goal of upper tract protection. Surgical intervention may be needed for bladder safety or to optimize continence. Uh, and it's important to integrate the patient's specific needs and goals. Um, I find that the adolescent population is one population that uh, will definitely tell you uh, what's wrong, uh, but not always uh, be sure of kind of what they want to do about it. And that's why I think it's really important to think about this patient, think about the family unit, and kind of think about the future, um, and think about their future independence. Uh, if they have the dexterity, involve our colleagues, such as physical medicine, um, occupational therapy, to figure out, you know, what what is the, what is the long-term trajectory um, and how can we best serve this patient and, uh, and, and try to do a procedure, you know, if needed, uh, that might be optimal for them. And we also have to think about the fact that teenagers and adolescents um, sometimes are not fantastic at adherence to catheterization schedules. They may skip their catheterizations. Um, they may feel that it takes too long. They don't want to be in the bathroom that long. Um, this is where I found bladder ultrasound pre and post catheterization to be super helpful to kind of demonstrate, did you actually empty all the way? Um, because every once in a while we find someone who said I was completely empty and has a good amount left in their bladder. Um, the visual view I find really helpful. And then I like to, again, empower by close discussion and validation of current views. No teenager wants to feel different. Um, neither does any young adult. And so I think that at times, um, um, it's important to just address uh, their concerns by saying, you know, certainly this is your current view. And how do we kind of take a mini step forward uh, to promote autonomy and ownership of their healthcare needs? Um, because most teenagers will come out of this adolescent phase um, and then be able to uh, um, take that autonomy and build on it. Um, and, uh, and actually most uh, of our older um, patients um, do, do feel pride about the amount of energy and, and effort they've been able to overcome uh, these uh, obstacles. And then when we think about mucus, lack of irrigation, we can end up with surgical issues. Um, and so that's something we want to avoid if at all possible. When we think about surgical intervention, um, obviously the three main things that uh, that end up happening um, are uh, some degree of a channel catheterization. Um, oftentimes there may be a bladder augmentation depending on the hostility uh, or continence needs. Um, and then in uh, severe refractory cases, a bladder neck closure may have occurred. Um, and all of those I think are uh, somewhat overwhelming for certain uh, providers in the community uh, or um, people who are used to doing other types of uh, urology. Um, however, I think that uh, um, if the patient is stable, uh, having somebody locally and having somebody who can be their surgical specialist um, is not an unreasonable approach. Um, and uh, the other thing is uh, making sure that uh, the families know about what, the, what needs to be monitored um, and what, need, what warrants a phone call. And most of the time um, the families know this, but the patients don't always know this. And that's again where we try to empower them uh, to, to really take healthcare ownership. Now, obviously, bladder perforation is a feared complication. Uh, it is an acute surgical need and may be misdiagnosed by medical counterparts. Uh, unfortunately, did have the experience of um, 
receiving a patient uh, many, many years ago in training uh, who was uh, watched at a, uh, a hospital um, with uh, abdominal pain, um, ultimately had a perforation and did well, um, but uh, really probably could have benefited from earlier intervention. Um, and so that's where I think the high index of suspicion and education of the patient and caregivers and support folks um, can really help um, make sure that if there's anything going on uh, that could resemble a bladder or perforation, it gets ch promptly checked out at an appropriate place. And I wanted to touch briefly on sexual reproductive health. Um, and I think that this is particularly important as urologists, especially urologists that follow patients over time, uh, because it encompasses many critical aspects of adolescent and young adult care, uh, such as pubertal development, romantic relationships, sexual orientation, function, family planning, and fertility. Um, and this was uh, a list uh, from a paper out of um, uh, Dr. Frederick, who is one of our oncologists uh, here in Connecticut, um, who has a special interest in sexual health, and she's been a wonderful uh, partner when we do uh, some of our adolescent work. And when you think about body image, body image is something that's personal and not easily shared by most patients, uh, but it may drive certain decisions and viewpoint in adolescents. Um, uh, several studies have looked at uh, cosmesis from scars, and I think that when we're thinking about a complex medical population, that can be different than um, a, a well population. And in the neurogenic population, uh, cosmesis from scars did impact body image and confidence. Um, and uh, in recent papers, the authors suggested that their VP scar was most bothersome. Um, however, a fear of new scars was present in female patients, really trying to minimize the, the visible um, reminders of some of their medical uh, um, concerns. And so I think those are all important things to incorporate when we're thinking about, you know, how best to treat this patient. And then obviously sex. It's important to talk about sex in an adolescent population because uh, um, it's important for information to come from a valuable source. However, I think that myths are, are something that are hard to get around with. Um, plenty of uh, patients over the years had said, I didn't think I could get pregnant. Um, and then uh, certainly things work. <laughs> I had one patient a few uh, years ago whose um, guardian brought him in and said, I don't know if those testicles work. Um, and we said, oh, no, nope, they do. Uh, let's talk about that. And so I think it's, it's, in the past, perhaps we didn't ask. Um, and with many providers, there can be an uncertain responsibility. For example, if the patients use gynecology and pediatric urology, um, gynecologists might feel that the urologist will talk about sexual concerns, the pediatric urologist may focus on bladder health, and the sexual concerns go unaddressed. And I think Dr. Shepard um, has really highlighted a, you know, a special need in the spina bifida population to really talk to patients about this, um, and has written some lovely papers uh, really just highlighting that patients want to know and as their long-term care um, providers, I think that we, we, we should have answers and ask the questions. And so when we think about sexual health, um, even in uh, certain uh, earlier changes, we can see precocious puberty and pubertal changes may start earlier in some conditions. Um, I think it's important to have education about sexual abuse, um, higher in populations with higher care needs and intellectual disability. And so it's important to have that on the back of our uh, list, even though it's never something we, we want, to, want to run into. Um, and then when we think about sexual health, um, they need a stable relationship and interpersonal relationships are key here. Um, with men in spina bifida, it was been no studies that partners often in the medical field, um, and the neurologic status can determine the degree of sensation, erectile function, um, and continence and can certainly impair confidence. When we think about women's sexual health, um, for example, in spina bifida below L3, there is a preserved ability to have sensation and orgasm. Um, and when we think about pelvic health and intercourse, um, patients with bladder extrophy and spina bifida are both at risk for prolapse, as well as clinical anomalies, variations in sex development. They can have a history of vaginal stenosis um, or various surgical interventions that may impact their sexual lives. When we think about men's sexual health, I think for us urologists, we are used to talking about this. Um, however, sensation may be impaired with neurologic conditions. There may be residual cord D uh, after surgical intervention or lack of surgical intervention, and there may be erectile dysfunction. Um, we note this in various conditions with the absence of identifiable risk factors in well um, young men. Um, and in spina bifida, for example, uh, L3, again, uh, under 75% may be able to have independent erectile 
directions. Um, and they may ejaculate just less forceful. So I think, you know, talking about these things, getting a sense of what the patient's questions are, um, and really just being a resource uh, can help immensely. And then fertility education remains critical. Um, so obviously fertility planning is uh, an ideal state rather than um, unintended uh, pregnancies. And we wanna think about contraception in a proactive way and routine gynecologic care, um, knowing that subfertility in men can happen just by normal testosterone levels. And that could be a patient with a history of undescended testicles um, or if there's um, other types of uh, infertility going on, that can present in the young years. Increased risk of uh, conditions in the offspring, for example, in spina bifida, there's a risk of neural tube conditions. And then when we think about obstetrics considerations, um, again, preconception planning, is a pregnancy desired? If not, discuss contraception. Um, and if yes, I think it's important to prepare. Think about the medical history, active conditions, uh, consideration of supplements and preconception visits with specialists. Um, and really, I think this is where making sure that you have a care team is critical um, because certainly I don't think a urologist should be the one optimizing the medical history. Um, but if this is the first doctor that's asked them about pregnancy, um, then from there, we want to make sure we support the patient. Uh, we think about preconception counseling. I think it's important to review the current status of medical issues. Uh, in our population, the most common things we'll run into are renal insufficiency, which could progress during uh, pregnancy. Um, and then pelvic helps, uh, health, uh, prolapse, and incontinence may worsen. And I think it's important, again, to educate regarding key pregnancy signs. There are several uh, conditions that can end up with risks to fetus and preeclampsia. And when we think about sort of certain populations, I think this graphic out of Dr. Shepard's paper was very useful, thinking about the rate of deliveries among women with spina bifida. Certainly it has been increasing over the last decade. Uh, and that's something that I would suspect as more of our patients with um, uh, spinal dysraphism age into the adult world, uh, we would expect them to complete uh, you know, pregnancy, delivery, things like that. So when you think about obstetric considerations, um, mostly there's a lot of things that, uh, that we would expect in this population. Uh, Preeclampsia can happen, um, especially with chronic kidney disease and preterm delivery may occur. Uh, in women with bladder extrophy due to the pelvic anatomy, about 50% may have breech presentation. Um, and then when we think about urinary tract infections, the most common of things that we deal with, um, with those with reflux nephropathy, almost 30 to 40% may have that. Um, we may have hydronephrosis or progression of um, renal insufficiency, as I mentioned. Uh, planned cesarean versus vaginal birth will be dependent on the surgical history and diagnosis. Uh, it's debatable if um, every patient with a reconstruction requires, um, you know, cesarean section. There's certainly patients who have spontaneous births without care. Um, however, I think it's important to plug these patients into a high-risk center for management, co-management cool of uh, conditions such as reflux nephropathy involving the nephrologist earlier. And then for extra fee, thinking about a baseline maternal ultrasound uh, to check for any hydronephrosis. Um, same with uh, neurogenic bladder, especially if there has uh, been uh, some degree of surgical intervention. When we think about reflux, uh, the thought is, do we need to fix all of this prior to pregnancy if there's a woman with uh, residual reflux? And evolving data from observational approach in recent years may provide some insights. The current pediatric recommendations think it's reasonable to correct reflux with scarring. Um, and asymptomatic persistent reflux does not necessarily require a correction prior to pregnancy. Um, but certainly, I think the data will evolve and we'll have a, a better answer to that. When we think about the transplant data, um, they have a refluxing anastomosis at many institutions. They're immunosuppressed. Um, and their recommendation is to treat asymptomatic bacteria during pregnancy, which is similar to what we would recommend in reflux. Uh, but anti-reflux surgery is not routine. And so when we think about recent advances in adolescent and young health, adult health, um, I again think that telehealth is really, really important and actually can be quite useful. I do think it's important to know that you may not be certain of confidentiality. Um, I think that if the patient uh, is only showing you their, their um, their face, it's possible there's somebody else in the room. It's important to verify, um, but if it's a patient at risk, uh, maybe not uh, think about um, 
potentially triggering conversations to be had. Um, we can allow for remote monitoring of conditions. There's smart technology such as smart water balls and mental health support with text check-ins. Um, and I think that this could definitely be optimized for um, our patients. Um, I consistently uh, run into patients who just forget to catheterize. Um, and I think that there's plenty of reminders and, 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 and factors out there. I've yet to find one that seems to work for everyone. Um, so if anyone has any suggestions, please uh, um, mention that. However, um, I think that uh, continuing to harness technology for the future and for further research uh, would really behoove us to, to you know, make some good choices uh, and try to help patients moving forward. And so what can we do as urologists? Transition is a long process, many pieces of the puzzle, and institutional support may or may not be present. Begin the patient early. Uh, as I mentioned, I usually try to tackle one item per visit, and then I document that moving forward as to what was done to each visit. This is the transition timeline again, just for review. And then this is an example from the GOT transition as a flow sheet, thinking about, did we talk about the policy? Did they talk about transition readiness? And from there, are there different things to tackle? Build the team. As I mentioned, uh, urologists are key care providers for complex patients, um, and they may have longer term relationships, even if it was a more straightforward condition. Um, you may have to actively work to identify and refer to collaborating care teams, um, such as a nephrologist, obstetrician, physical medicine, and general surgeon, all types of uh, consultants that might be useful in your particular care team. Um, and depending on where the patient lives, there may be a local or tertiary care center uh, that could work jointly together, or if you have a new involved primary care uh, provider, that can certainly be helpful too. Uh, dedicate your available resources, utilize patient portal staff messaging to try to reduce no-shows. Um, and I think that what we've noticed is at the 18 year mark, uh, we have to make sure that we have a release to talk to family, that we have a phone number to contact the patient directly um, and plan for that in advance. Identify hurdles and interventions such as insurance, social work, and travel support, and try our best to do care coordination so that if the patient's coming to the hospital, they could see many of their specialists on the same day. In terms of best practices, we want to provide a detailed plan of history and active issues and future issues. Um, be available for questions and concerns and partner with primary care. If you're the receiving provider, try to prepare the patient with your own literature review. There's plenty of guidelines out on many of these uh, conditions, but some of them are, are too rare or have yet to have high quality literature. Um, and I think that that's where ongoing support uh, and research can be, can be helpful. If it's not an ideal fit, try to optimize the current active issues while providing support to identify a more appropriate provider. Um, for the receiving provider, if the patient makes it to you, that is actually a success. Um, many individuals with medically complex conditions report fatigue and a sense of rejection by providers who would not see me. Um, so if the patient arrives and you realize that perhaps you are not the best person to take care of this patient, try to triage target active issues, and then build a referral network to find a specialist that will actually accept this patient um, and then may be able to uh, continue their care. Um, keeping in mind that many patients may not require any active uh, surgical needs, may require monitoring and general urologic care, uh, and pediatric and adolescent specialists are available to help. So my takeaway points are ask. Uh, what you feel most important may not be the primary concern. Educate, empower the family, supports with information about the diagnosis, and educate receiving providers. And then again, provide support. The first attempt at transition is sometimes not successful. Um, we have support organizations specific to diagnosis that can be helpful um, or uh, your local colleagues. And this is my uh, view from uh, the kitchen this morning with our brand new snow. <laughs> I hope everyone in California is a little bit warmer. Um, and if you have any questions, my email is here um, and uh, Twitter handle as well. Thank you guys so much for uh, letting me speak. Um, and I'll try to look through the questions and see if there's any more right now. All right, so I have one question uh, that looks about um a positive asymptomatic urine cultures in a pregnant woman who does CIC. And I think that this is this is one of the, the question marks. I think that uh, it's particularly useful to monitor the patient and have a sense of what their um, symptoms are. And I most of the literature would suggest that treating at least the first one is not unreasonable. Um, but as anyone who takes care of patients who do CIC, uh, we will notice that many of the urine cultures will be positive. And so there, I think we need to continue to closely monitor um, some Practitioners will use prophylaxis throughout pregnancy. I think it's a little bit um, 
practitioner dependent and hospital dependent, and also depends on the patient if they've had sepsis episodes or pyelonephritis. Um, if it's a patient that's purely asymptomatic with uh, CIC, um, I would probably err on the side of uh, trying to avoid treatment throughout the whole pregnancy. All right. Does anyone have any other questions? All right, so I'll put the survey here. Um, and again, I thank everybody for attending um, and feel free to reach out if there's additional questions or concerns. And I hope everyone has a happy new year. <laughs>